So keep your place here in 1 Corinthians 7. We're going to come right back and turn, if you would, to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. And what we preach about this morning is how to find a godly spouse. The, you know, the day and age that we live in is, you know, the world's getting crazier and crazier. And people are, um, you know, marriages are failing left and right. Marriages are failing even inside of, of Christianity. I mean, you look at, at just Christianity at large, right? The, the greater umbrella of Christianity. And you're seeing numbers that are rivaling the world's success rate of marriages and marriages ending in divorce and everything like that. And there are many reasons for this and many problems associated with this. And it, I don't even have enough time to get into every aspect of why so many marriages are failing. But the, the main reason it could be summed up in that people aren't taking God's word seriously anymore is the bottom line. God's word gives us all the details that we need, all the information that we need. And if we're sincere and if we could hold to the truths found in scripture, these things wouldn't be happening. I mean, at the end of the day, getting divorced is a choice. It's a choice. No one's forcing you to go and, and annul or, or cancel your marriage that you have with your spouse. You are choosing to do that. And, and at the end of the day, I'll just, you know, I'm going to leave this point at this. When you make a vow before God that says, I'm going to stay with this person until death parts us, like that is the ending point of our marriage. And then later on, other things happen and you, you know, you, life happens, you have all these other problems and then you end up divorcing your spouse. You've broken your vow to God. And unfortunately, way too many people today are flippant about the vows that they make. And it's, it's, it's becoming viewed, marriage is becoming viewed as just the next step in your relationship of it's kind of like boyfriend, girlfriend plus, but it doesn't have the same sanctity and meaning that it once had. And I'm going to help try to give, there's a lot of single, single people with us this morning, try to help give some godly principles in finding a spouse, finding the right spouse, finding someone who you're going to be able to stay committed to and stay with forever. As long as, as both of you shall live. That's, that's the goal. And, and if we're wise in how we choose the, the people that we choose to marry, then that is a, a, a great first step in making sure that you have a successful marriage. Uh, I had you turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 6. We're going to look at verse number 14 because rule number one, if you're going to find a spouse, you have to make sure that they are saved, that they are a believer in Jesus Christ. That is number one, most important. If you, if, if you are liking people and you, you know, you're, you're interested in someone, you're looking for someone to marry, and that person is not saved, that is not marriage material right off the bat. The, your, your salvation is, is, should be the closest thing, you know, the, the most uh, dear thing, the most precious thing that you have in your life, your, your relationship with God, the fact that you're a child of God because you're a believer in Jesus Christ, that should shape and form all the decisions that you make in your life. And if someone does not have that, you are going to be at odds all the time. And... I'll just show it from scripture too, because not just, it doesn't just make sense logically, but look at verse number 14 in 2 Corinthians 6. The Bible says, be not unequally yoked together with unbelievers. Now, when you're yoked together, you're, you're grouped up. They're talking about referring to a yoke, like they would put oxen in a yoke where they're, they're working together. It's a, it's a piece of wood that goes around their necks and kind of forces them to be working together. You can apply this verse in many ways. Because we ought not to be unequally yoked with unbelievers in many areas of our life. But what bigger yoke is there than the yoke of marriage? Where you're living together and you're devoted to each other and you vowed to stay together for life. That is a big yoke. And that is something that, that the Bible is saying, look, be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness and what communion hath light with darkness and what concord hath Christ with Belial or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel this is not the person that you want to be yoking up with if they're an unbeliever now if you, if you meet someone and you have a lot of things in common your number one priority should be trying to get them saved 
Because that commonality, that newness, and, and I remember dating, I've been married for a while now, but I remember dating, and there's a certain newness when you meet somebody, and it's kind of fun, and they're interesting, and you talk about things, you know, whatever, but if that person is not saved, guess what? That newness only lasts so long. And we're talking about a lifetime. I mean, you, you have to be keeping the importance of, of marriage in mind when, it, when you think about it in terms of it's my whole life. That's what you're signing up for. You're signing up for being with this person for the rest of your life. Just assume that your, your spouse is going to outlive you, right? You can't say, oh, well, yeah, I'm going to wait for them to die and then, and then I'll be free to marry someone else. No, you, you have to go into it thinking that you're going to be the one. They're gonna be the, you're going to be the one to die first, not them. That's going to be the rest of your life. Let's go back, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 7. <clears throat> and this is, this is where we get this, I mean, this is, this is coming straight from God's word. 1 Corinthians chapter 7, look at verse number 39. The Bible says, The wife is bound by the law as long as her husband liveth, but if her husband be dead, she is at liberty to be married to whom she will, only in the Lord. So there's a couple of things I want to point out. Is that one, it's saying, look, as long as your husband's alive, you're bound by the law unto that person. You're committed to them. You've made the vow. You're married to that person and that's it. And then it, this is talking about a widow. If her husband be dead, if your spouse dies and you become widowed, the Bible says, look, you're at liberty. She's at liberty. She can marry whoever she wants. Go ahead. Choose who you want to be married to. But then it says, only in the Lord. So it, 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 there's that restriction put in there again. They ought to be a believer. It's someone that's, that's, a, a, that, that's another believer to not be unequally yoked together. So that's, that's number one in finding a spouse. Make sure that they're saved. They need to be righteous. Now, uh, you know, these days we have people, you know, the, the world's philosophy, and, and young people are seeing this, that all the failed marriages and stuff. So what do they want to do? They want to postpone marriage. Say, well, I'm not going to get married. But... This is foolish. The Bible says to rejoice with the wife of thy youth. And, you know, for this cause shall a man leave father and mother and shall cleave to his wife. You know, the, the whole family has been just eroded when it comes to a scriptural family, a biblical family, the way things ought to be. The world has a way too much influence, even in Christian homes. Christian homes are saying, no, no, okay, you're going to leave father and mother, I'm going to send you off to college. You're going to leave father and mother, and you're going to go off, you, you turn 18, okay, now you're going to go off and get a job, you're going to go and do all these other things. And that just, that just opens up the door for, for sin. That's going to open up the door for fornication. It's going to open up the door for things that you don't want your child to be a part of. Amen. Now look, I, I know I'm pre the, the main focus is going to be finding a spouse to help people who are single, but say, well, I'm married, well, what does the sermon have to do with me? Well, maybe you have children. You know, or maybe you're going to have children one day. These are important things that you're going to need to know to help to raise your children, teach these truths to your children so that they can know how to find a godly spouse. Because what we don't want happening is what's happening right now in the world. That's the last thing we want. But the, see, the world's solution is, well, since there's so many divorces happening, I'm going to wait. I'm going to hold off. I'm going to date somebody for five years or 10 years or whatever. And we're going to live together. And then we're going to have a family. And then if things are working out, then we'll get married. And look, this is the world's philosophy. This is the way people want to do things now. But I'll tell you right now, it's wicked as hell. That is not God's design. That is not what he said to do. He said, you leave father and mother and cleave to your wife. You get married, you make the commitment because anything outside of marriage when you have that relationship is fornication. And we're going to get into that in just a minute. Now, I want to cover with something real quick. Turn, if you would, to Luke 16. Luke chapter 16 contains a verse here that I think is way too oftentimes skipped in churches today when we're talking about divorce because we're talking about rules. I'm going over real basic ground rules. When you find a spouse, first, they need to be saved. Second, you need to try to find someone who is not divorced. People view marriage today as, you know, oh, we'll get a divorce. It's like breaking up with your boyfriend or breaking up with your girlfriend. No, that's not the way that the Bible considers divorce. It's much more serious than that. You say, oh, well, if, I don't, if things don't work out with my husband, if things don't work out with my wife, 
we'll just get a divorce, and then I'll just go off and marry somebody else. That's the way boyfriends and girlfriends work. That's not the way marriages work. That's not the way that God said marriages should work in the Bible. Look at what Jesus Christ, our Savior, said in Luke chapter 16 and verse number 18. Whosoever putteth away his wife, that's divorce, and marrieth another, committeth adultery. He's saying if you go and get divorced, you put your wife away, and then you just go, well, I'm going to go and marry someone else. He says you commit adultery. And whosoever marrieth her that is put away from her husband committeth adultery. You say, well, I've never been divorced before. Well, whosoever marrieth her that has been put away, you marry in someone else that's been divorced. Look, this is a serious deal. God treats that vow as being very permanent, being serious, being forever. Why is this not being taught? You know, a lot of people hear this verse and be like, wow, I never heard that before. It's because you're being brainwashed by the world and the thinking that marriage isn't really that big of a deal anymore. I mean, these days they're trying to make marriages between, you know, the, 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 the sodomites and just, oh, man and man and women and women, they could get married. Next thing you know, it's going to be men marrying animals and, and who knows? I mean, they're just going to be completely destroying the whole concept of what marriage is to begin with. About the, the man and woman becoming one flesh and starting a family. It's wicked. But, I mean, there it is in Scripture. You know what? Write this reference down and go ahead and read it later for yourself and read the whole, all of chapter Luke 16. Go back and read it in Matthew and get the full context of this and you can find out for yourself. I'm not just ripping this verse out of context. This is what Jesus Christ said. You can find the same reference in Matthew where it says, Whosoever put away his, his wife, saving for the cause of fornication. Okay. And that is the one stipulation, excuse me, in the Mosaic law that was put forward, that, adult, uh, that divorce can be acceptable, but it says except it be for fornication. Fornication is different than adultery. They're not the same thing. Fornication is what happens prior to marriage. Adultery is what happens after marriage. And the way that it would work, just, Jesus, or excuse me, Joseph and Mary were the perfect example of what the law is referring to. Joseph and Mary were espoused to one another, but they had not consummated their marriage yet when Mary was, uh, conceived Jesus through the Holy Ghost in her womb. It talks about Joseph and Mary being espoused to one another, right? But they had not come together because she was a virgin. So the Bible says that Joseph, being a just man, was, was minded to put her away Privily. He didn't want to make her public. He didn't want to make a big deal out of it, a big show. But obviously he found out, you know, except in this one case, of course, we know this, there's only one way that, that, that women become pregnant. And, you know, and, and in this case, obviously, it was, it was a major exception through our, our Savior's birth. But Joseph was a just man, the Bible says, and he was considering divorcing her. Why? Because she had committed fornication. And it was obvious with her being pregnant. So prior to the consummation, that was allowed. But even Jesus Christ, when he was explaining this to the Pharisees, because they're like, well, hey, can a, can a man put away his wife for every cause? And he says, no. They're like, well, why did Moses give us a, a bill of divorcement? Why, why did he say you could put your wife away? And Jesus said, for the hardness of your hearts, he gave you this precept. But from the beginning, it was not so. He said, and that's not the way God intended it ever. He says the intention is that you, could, you, you marry your spouse and you stay together. And that that's the person that you're married to and you don't get divorced. There was one aspect of the law that allowed for divorce. But see, what people want to do these days, they find that one thing, that one scenario, that one situation, and then they want to blow it up in everything. And they'll say, oh, well, they committed fornication in their heart or they did this or they did, you know, that's not the way it works. We need to be, have integrity when it comes to God's word and we need to just accept the Bible for what it says. And if Jesus Christ said, whosoever putteth away his wife and marrieth another committeth adultery and whosoever marrieth her that is put away from her husband committeth adultery, we ought to take those words seriously. And if you want your marriage to last and if you want to do things the way that God's word says and you want God's blessing upon your marriage, don't be looking for someone that is already divorced. 
I would say the, the one exception to that is if someone got divorced, but then their spouse has already died. Because in a sense, then they would be widowed and then they'd be free to marry whom they will only in the Lord. That would be a case where you could probably do that. But deciding on marrying someone is a big deal. This is not a choice to be made flippantly or for the wrong reasons. Because again, you're considering someone that you're going to live with. Living with someone, spending all your time with, you, you know, you need to love that person, you need to care for that person. It, you know, we need to be careful. Why, you know, a lot of people have, um, I've met people that maybe their aspiration is to be a pastor. And, and the Bible says in, in um, 1 Timothy that, that, the, that the bishop is to be the husband of one wife and that he's supposed to, to rule his own house well and he has children, you know, and there's these qualifications and they're thinking, well, I just want to get married because I want to be a pastor someday. Well, that's great that you want to, you know, if you desire the office of a bishop, the Bible says you desire a good work. But don't just go and marry somebody and make that vow unless you're serious and seriously committed to that person, you love that person, it's someone you do want to spend the rest of your life with, and you're not just trying to check off a box so that you can go ahead and, and do whatever other thing. Or people do that to get visas in the country, do other things, you know, whatever. There's all kinds of different reasons why, you know, to get benefits from the government. Oh, I just want to have less taxes or something. And, and people end up getting married. And look, that's the wrong reason. Now, it may be beneficial. It may help you. It may be a goal. You may want to get married because you want to have a family. You want to have a spouse. That's great. Look for a spouse then. But just understand that this is a lifelong decision that you are making. And you have to have the attitude that once you're married, you stay married until one of you is dead. That is what you are committing to, and that's what you're getting into. You have to find someone that has the right priorities and values. And this is, so I'm going to get into finding a wife and finding a husband in just a minute, but the, the, the basics for either finding a husband or a wife, you need to find someone who's saved, you need to find someone who's not divorced, and someone who's a godly person. Someone who loves God's word, someone who loves the Bible and has their priorities and their values that line up with yours. Because priorities and values will determine all of the major decisions that you're going to make in the future. When you decide what you're going to do, where you're going to live, where you're going to go to church, where, you know, all these lifelong decisions, it's going to be based off of what you believe, what's in your heart, what's driving that. What do you care about? What do you prioritize? Someone who's just real greedy and all they care about is money and they have a love of money, where the Bible says the love of money is the root of all evil. Well, guess what? They're going to be making all their decisions based on money. Oh, I can't go to church today because I have to work. Oh, I can't do, the, you know, I can't read my Bible. I got too much work to do. I got all this other stuff to do. I'm trying to make money. And if you marry someone like that, you're not going to be very happy. Just, it's just a fact. You need, you, you know, we, we want to look for people that have the right values. Turn, if you would, to the book of Proverbs. We're going to look at um, Proverbs 18. I'm going to read this for you. In 1 Timothy chapter 5, verse 14, the Bible says, I will, therefore, that the younger women marry, bear children, guide the house, Give none occasion to the adversary to speak reproachfully. And yes, we are an old-fashioned Baptist church. We are an old-fashioned uh, group of believers here. You say, oh, that, that sounds, you know, younger women marry, bear children, guide the house. What are you talking about? You're crazy. Don't you know that this is 2018? Don't you know that, that men and women are both should be going off to work and, and you put your child in daycare and you go and do all this other stuff? No, that's not what the world does. This is not the way that God designed things. God designed men and women. And I know it's going to come as a shock to you, but God designed men and women differently. <laughs> it, it's, it's, it's radical, I know. It, it, it's just as radical as you wouldn't want to be married to someone. Of this, you're like, I, I don't want to be married to a man. I don't want someone who's exactly like me. I'm, I thank God for making women Amen. to be feminine, to be women. Amen to be who they are, the, who God created them to be. And thank God that God made men to be men and to be the way that he created men to be. There's differences. Men are stronger than women. I'm sorry, that's a fact of nature. You can't change that. That's the way that God made us. 
Women are very nurturing and very caring, and they're excellent at dealing with children and being multitasking and doing all kinds of, you know, both men and women both have very good strong points that they're better suited to do. And if we're going to put aside the political correctness nonsense and the philosophies of this world and get our minds into God's word and see the way that God has designed us to be, you're going to be happier in your life when you follow the roles that God has given you. And when the Bible says, I will, therefore, that the younger women marry, bear children, which means you have children, and you guide the house, give none occasion to the adversary speak reproachfully, this is one of the things, this is God's will for your life, younger women. This is what God wants you to do. Get married. Have kids. Have a family. Raise those kids. That's a big investment. Look, children are the future. Children are important. They're not a burden. They're not a nuisance. And they shouldn't be, be viewed as such. Don't be so focused on your career and all these other aspirations you want to have. Let your husband do that. Let your husband make the money. Let your husband go and sweat by the work of his brow and provide for you so that you can do really the most important job of raising your own children, to be godly children, to love the Lord and to carry this generation forward and not neglect them and just leave them to their own devices or leave them for somebody else to raise, someone else who may not have the same morals and values and principles that you have. Treat them with utmost. This is, this is a, a big job. People want to say, oh, you're demeaning to women because you're saying you just want women to stay at home and raise kids and, and cook food. You know, how is that demeaning? Seriously, how is that demeaning? Does that mean because, the, because they're not a man, because they're not filling a man's role, that just means they're demeaning? You know, the feminist movement these days, it's, it, it's, it's weird because they're the ones that's putting more value on the man's job than, than regular men are doing. I value my wife. I love my wife. I am so thankful that my wife has the job that she has. Our family wouldn't work nearly as good as it does if she wasn't doing her job while I'm doing a different job. We could focus on our own jobs. And both are very important. It's very important for me to be able to provide for my family and to work hard and to get things done. And it's very important for her to, to raise our children and to make sure that the house is being kept in order while I'm gone. These things are very important and we need to, to understand our roles and we understand our roles and what God wants for our life. Again, it's going to bring us more joy. It's going to bring us more peace because we'll be walking in the will of God for our lives. And we want to find somebody, you want to find somebody if you're single that looks to Scripture the same way, that looks to scripture and just says, I want to be the best husband or I want to be the best wife that I can be because I want my marriage to work and I want to find somebody else who shares that same value and they're in their role and they want to do what's right. That is what's going to bring you success. The Bible says, have you turn to Proverbs 18? Look at verse number 22. We're going to get into some, some attributes for finding a wife. Proverbs 18.22 says, Whoso findeth a wife, findeth a good thing. It's a good thing to find a wife. Praise God. And obtaineth favor of the Lord. God gives you favor when you find a good wife. Turn, if you would, to Proverbs chapter 7. Now, this is geared for men in choosing a wife, but ladies, listen up, because this is the way that you are going to want to be or not want to be based on finding a godly man who's looking to the Bible for his direction. We're going to look at first in Proverbs 7 what not to look for, who you want to avoid when it comes to finding a wife. Who, who, who's the type, what's the type of wife you don't want to have anything to do with? Verse number 7 in Proverbs chapter 7. We'll get some wisdom from the book of Proverbs. The Bible says, And behold, among the simple ones I discerned among the youths a young man void of understanding. Not a very smart guy. Verse number 8, Passing through the street near her corner. And he went the way to her house in the twilight, in the evening, in the black and dark night. And behold, there met him a woman with the attire of an harlot and subtle of heart. So we're going to continue on in this story. You're going to see why this is not the woman that you want to be married to. But right off the bat, what does it say? The attire of an harlot. People say, oh, I should be able to wear whatever I want. Yeah, but what you wear 
is reflective of who you are. It is. And if, some, if a woman's going to go out and dress, I mean, everyone should know what a whore looks like. A prostitute. That's what a harlot is. Just to, just to make sure there's no misunderstanding here. This is a dress and attire of a harlot. What in the world would you, if you are not a harlot, why would you ever want to go out looking like one? Why would you ever want to go out in your immodest apparel, showing off your body, showing off your curves, showing off these things? If you want to find a godly man, do you, you want to find someone who's just interested in your body that just wants to use you? Or you're interested in someone who's going to love you and care for you and provide for you. When you go out dressed like a harlot, yeah, you're going to get a lot of eyeballs on you. But they're not going to be the eyeballs that you want on you. And men, don't be deceived by the attire of a harlot. Yeah, your flesh is going to say, oh, wow, look at that. Oh, man, she's beautiful. Oh, man, I want to have that like a kid in a candy store or something. Don't, don't let your flesh overrule your senses and overrule what, what God's word is going to warn you about. Because someone who's dressed like a harlot, you have to just assume they are a harlot. Amen. And that you're no different and you're no special and that they're just looking for attention from anybody. And we're going to see that that's what this person is being described as. Look at verse number 11. She is loud and stubborn. A loud and stubborn woman, these are not godly attributes to have uh, as, as women. This is not something you should be looking for if you're finding someone who meets these attributes. Uh, this is not the woman for you, men. Her feet abide not in her house. Remember, the Bible says that he, he would, that the younger women would marry, bear children, guide the house. Well, here's someone whose feet are not abiding in her house, and she's loud, and she's stubborn, she's obnoxious. Now is she without, now in the streets, and lieth and waited every corner. So she caught him and kissed him, and with an impudent face said unto him, I have peace offerings with me. This day have I paid my vows. So she, she, go, she comes up to this guy and kisses him. Watch out for the girls that are too fast, that are just looking to, you know, I mean, right, she just meets this guy, and she's already kissing him. Stay away. Too fast, because if she's doing that to you, guess what? She's already done that before, and she'll do it again. You're not that special. But see, and, and she, she uses these words, you know, in this, in this proverb, she says, oh, I have peace offerings with me. I paid my vows. So she might talk the religious talk, right? Oh, I love God. I go to church. Yet she's dressed like a harlot, and she's quick to, to get physical with you. Stay away. That's not marriage material. Just stay away. Verse number 15, Therefore came I forth to meet thee diligently to seek thy face. And look at the flattery. Oh, I was just looking for you. It's a snare. It's a trap. And I have found thee. I have decked my bed with coverings of tapestry, with carved works, with fine linen of Egypt. I have perfumed my bed with myrrh, aloes, and cinnamon. Come, let us take our fill of love until the morning. Let us solace ourselves with loves. And you know, that's the word that she wants to use, love. Oh, it's loving and, and oh, this sounds so great. And the Bible refers to that, fornication, wickedness, sin, harlot, whoremonger. But, but no, she's going to try to dress it up and make it, oh, we're just, we, we love each other. And you know what? This is what the, music, the, the world's music is going to teach you. Oh, it's just love. I mean, I remember growing up in a worldly home, growing up, listening to all this junk, and it influences you. And I, my sermon's not about music this morning, but I'll tell you what, there is a, there's a song that specifically comes to mind, and I know it's kind of silly, but there's a, a song that Bon Jovi put out, was, yeah, going back to the 80s, right? And, and he had a song, and, and it's not unique to him by any means. This is a common theme. And he had a song that's, you know, are we living in love or are we living in sin? You know, he's just like, oh, I think this is love. And we don't need a preacher, you know. We don't need to, to sign on the line to show, to show that we love each other and stuff. He's saying, we don't need marriage. We don't need the Bible. These guys are saying we're in sin, but I say it's just love. Why? Because he's a whoremonger. He's trying to dress up his sin and make it sound real nice and real good. But you know what? It's not. It stinks. In God's eyes, it's wickedness. And don't be deceived by these music. Oh, it sounds so nice and so good. But I'll tell you what, kids get caught up into that. I, I'll tell, that was getting involved in my mind. 
Unfortunately, I made a lot of stupid decisions when I was younger. I wish I could say that I stayed pure until, until my wedding day, but it didn't happen. And part of the reason is because I'm being influenced by this garbage going across the airwaves saying, hey, it's not sin, it's love. And not getting involved in reading the Bible and reading scripture to see what does God really think about this. Don't deceive yourselves and don't get caught up with the brainwashing that's going on out there in the world that's trying to get you to sin with ultimately Satan is just dressing up sin to make it look as attractive as possible. Let's keep reading here. Verse number 19, For the good man is not at home. He has gone a long journey. He hath taken a bag of money with him and will come at the day appointed. With her, her much fair speech, she caused him to yield. With the flattering of her lips, she forced him. He goeth after her straightway as an ox goeth to the slaughter or as a fool to the correction of the stocks till a dart strike through his liver as a bird hasteth to the snare and knoweth not that it is for his life. Again, these are God's word, not mine. This is God saying how, how bad this is. What a horrible deal. Oh, well, he's just going, he's just young. He's just having fun. He's at college. He's going to sow his wild oats. He's just going to go and get this out of his system. It's fine. That's not what the Bible says it is. It's not that big of a deal. It's just okay. Oh, yeah, he's just doing his thing. He'll get over it. The Bible says that he's a fool to go into the correction of the stocks till a dart strike through his liver. You want a dart going through your liver? I mean, that, that, doesn't sound, that doesn't sound very pleasant. Or as a bird hazes a snare, and knoweth not that it is for his life. And look, at it gets even stronger language. Verse number 24. Hearken unto me now, therefore, O ye children, and attend to the words of my mouth. Let not thine heart decline to her ways. Go not astray in her paths. For she hath cast down many wounded. Yea, many strong men have been slain by her. Don't think that you're above that temptation. Oh, I can handle it. I could still keep going out with the woman who's dressed like a harlot and the woman who's trying to kiss me and the woman who's doing all this other stuff. Many strong men have been slain by her. Don't think that you're stronger than that, that temptation. Avoid it. And then look at what it says in verse 27. Her house is the way to hell, going down to the chambers of death. Don't stay with the woman whose house is on the path to hell. All right, enough. Of Turn to Proverbs 31. Let's see what a woman you do want to look for. Proverbs 31. Very famous passage, passage of the Bible. And guys, if you're single and you're looking for somebody, you know, you ought to, to really spend a lot of time in Proverbs 31. And ladies, if you're looking for a godly man who's studying Proverbs 31, pay attention here and... and, and Try to fulfill what the Bible says is a virtuous woman. Someone who's a good woman. This is someone who you're looking for. This is the, the, the woman whose price is above rubies. It's very precious. It's a very precious thing to, to have someone who's godly to, to stay with you for the rest of your life. It's, it's a very precious thing to find. Not everybody's like that. Most people aren't. But if you're choosing to spend an, a, a lifetime with someone, take the time to find somebody. Now, look, I'm not saying it's going to take you 10 years to find someone. You know, maybe it will, but, but hopefully not. There's, there's plenty of people. I'm not, I also don't subscribe to this thing that there's only one person out there in the whole world that's <laughs> the right person for you. And if you don't find that person, then it's never going to be right. Okay, no. No, there's a lot of people. There's a lot of choices out there. And you can marry who you will, but make sure you marry them in the Lord. And, just, and then follow these guidelines. Proverbs 31, look at verse number one. We'll start reading here. I'm going to try to get through this quickly. Um, Bible reads, The words of King Lemuel, the prophecy that his mother taught him, What, my son, and what, the son of my womb, and what, the son of my vows? Give not thy strength unto women, nor thy ways to that which destroyeth kings. It is not for kings, O Lemuel, it is not for kings that drink wine, nor for princes strong drink. And ladies, if you want to marry a king, I know we're going to get into finding a man later, but this is good advice right here. Don't marry someone who's a drunkard. Don't marry someone who's given to wine, someone who likes to just drink. Because it's not for kings to drink wine, nor for princes strong drink, lest they drink and forget the law and pervert the judgment of any of the afflicted. Give strong drink unto him that is ready to perish, and wine unto those that be of heavy hearts. 
Let him drink and forget his poverty and remember his misery no more. Open thy mouth for the dumb in the cause of all such as are appointed to destruction. Open thy mouth, judge righteously, and plead the cause of the poor and needy. Verse number 10, we're going to start reading here on a virtuous woman. The Bible says, Who can find a virtuous woman? For her price is far above rubies. The heart of her husband doth safely trust in her, so that he shall have no need of spoil. Trust is the number one thing that's mentioned. The first thing that's mentioned is being able to trust your spouse, being trustworthy, being faithful. If your spouse isn't trusting you, that is going to cause nothing but problems in your marriage. I mean, that, that, that right off the bat, that will be the source of just problem after problem after problem. You need to find somebody trustworthy, someone that you can trust and that, and that no one's going to be worried about you going off and talking to other guys or you know, men going off and talking to other girls and all this other stuff. You need to have that trust so that you know that they're committed to you. Um, verse number 12, she will do him good and not evil all the days of her life. She seeketh wool and flax and worketh willingly with her hands. Now, I want you to pay attention as we read some of these verses, just the working, the hard work that a virtuous woman does. Now, we already mentioned, you say, what do you mean hard work? I thought you said that women shouldn't be out working. They should be guiding the house. If you think guiding the house and doing things at home isn't work, then you've never done it before. Seriously. My, my wife does not have a problem of not finding work to do at home. There is a lot of work. There's tons of work. Work never ends, okay? If you're doing your job right, there's going to be many things for you to do. So, but, but pay attention because guys want to marry someone who's not just lazy and, not, you know, and just, oh, we'll just take care of me and I'm not going to do anything. No, he wants to marry someone who's going to run the house right. It's going to be, be doing you know, good and is a hard worker themselves. She, she seeketh wool and flax and worketh willingly with her hands. She is like the merchant ship. She bringeth her food from afar. You know, bringing her food from afar is finding good deals, saving money, being efficient, being effective at, at her role and in, in, in managing some of the, the resources and finances to, to, at home to make sure everything is, um, she's doing the best that she can there. Verse 15, she riseth also while it is yet night and giveth meat to her household and a portion to her maidens. She considereth a field and buyeth it with the fruit of her hand. She planteth a vineyard. She girdeth her loins with strength and strengtheneth her arms. She perceiveth that her merchandise is good. Her candle goeth not out by night. Now we saw already she's getting up early in the morning while it's still you know, dark outside. And then it says her candle goeth not out by night. This is a hardworking woman. This is someone who's you know, getting up, I'm prepared, you know, she's preparing food, she's getting everything ready so that, that her house can just continue on with the work that they need to do. Because it's her job to prepare this up, it's her job to get things going, and she's staying up even late at night, continuing to work. Verse number 19, she layeth her hands to the spindle, and her hands hold the distaff. She stretcheth out her hand to the poor, yea, she reacheth forth her hands to the needy. So she's got a great heart too. She's very caring and loving and she's working so hard that she's able to help other people out. You know, she, she's, she's making clothing. She's, she's providing the food. She's doing all this stuff, but she stays up late and she's able to help other people out. Verse 21, she is not afraid of the snow for her household, for all her household are clothed with scarlet. Verse 22, she maketh herself coverings of, excuse me, of tapestry. Her clothing is silk and purple. Her husband is known in the gates when he sitteth among the elders of the land. And this is someone who's a virtuous woman ha having found a husband who's respected. That's what I mean when, you know, the, when her husband is, is known in the gates. The gates is where people would come and they, they would talk about things and, and maybe have judgment and, and get advice from, from people who are real wise. They'd be sitting in the gates or known in the gates. Um, when, you, when you read the Bible, you could get that information. But... Um, he sitteth among the elders of the land as someone who's respected. She's, she's got a good husband, a virtuous husband, as a virtuous woman. And virtuous women, you want to be a virtuous woman, look for the virtuous husband. And, and men, look for the virtuous woman. Verse number 24, she maketh fine linen and selleth it and delivereth girdles unto the merchant. Strength and honor are her clothing and she shall rejoice in time to come. She openeth her mouth with wisdom and in her tongue is the law of kindness. 
She looketh well to the ways of her household and eateth not the bread of idleness. She's not staying idle. She's working hard. Verse 28, her children arise up and call her blessed. Her husband also, and he praiseth her. And women, when, when you're living a life that's virtuous like this, how can your husband and children not bless you and, and, and praise you for all the good? When, when you are not eating the bread of idleness and just sitting around and scrolling through Facebook all, all day, but you're keeping yourself busy and you're doing work and, and you know, you're caring for your household, you're caring for your husband, you're caring for your family, of course they're going to praise you. They'll be very thankful for you. They'll be very appreciative of you. Many daughters have done virtuously, but thou excellest them all. Favor is deceitful and beauty is vain. But a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. Give her of the fruit of her hands and let her own works praise her in the gates. Verse 30 is a very important verse and I want to spend a little bit of time on this. Favor is deceitful and beauty is vain. When you are looking for a spouse, keep that in mind. You know, the, the beauty that, that youth often has doesn't last very long. And ultimately, it's vain, it's vain, it's, it's empty. So you can look on someone and say, wow, how beautiful, they're really attractive. But they can be full of, of rottenness and wickedness on the inside. That outward appearance and beauty, you, if, if you make the mistake, you're going to find out really quickly that that's meaningless. And when you start to see who the person is on the inside, if they're very ugly, even that beauty on the outward is going gonna, is gonna to go away because when you start to know who they really are on the inside, that's what you're going to end up seeing. That, you know, the, the more time you spend with someone, the beauty that they have on the inside is what you really end up seeing day in and day out. And keep that in mind. Now, I do think it's important that, that you should be attracted to your spouse. Okay? But when you're looking for a spouse, you, 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 your number one objective should not be, oh, they're hot or, you know, they're, they, they are just the most beautiful thing in the world. That is, that is of least importance. We need to be looking at their heart, looking at their values. What type of person are they? That is what's going to be the good spouse for you. They may have flaws in their physical characteristics. They may not have everything, you know, um, you know, all of their, their you know, hair parted perfectly and, and, you know, whatever. They may have some blemishes on their face. But I'll tell you what, if they have a good heart, if they love the Lord, if they want to serve God, and if they're going to be the best spouse for you, that is precious. That is where the true value lies, and that is going to help your marriage. Don't get caught up in, in the vanity of a person's appearance. Or, and especially don't be deceived by the harlot that wants to show you everything and may have some physical beauty, but they're really just wicked people and they, they're not going to end up loving you. They're not going to be godly. They're going to, you know, that that's what they're all about. Don't be deceived by that. Favor is deceitful and beauty is vain, but a woman that feareth the Lord, she shall be praised. Let's turn to... Um, Turn to Psalm 1. We just went over this on Wednesday. I'm going to switch gears a little bit. I'm going to try to get the rest of my content in here. Uh, we've got a little bit of time left. In finding a husband. Ladies that are looking for a husband, attributes that you want to find in a man, things that you want to look for, Number one, you want to find a man that loves God. And I mean, this goes, this goes for men and women. But the Bible says, Jesus Christ himself said in John 14, 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. So how are you going to know if a man loves God? You say, well, I don't know. I can't see his heart. I don't know if he loves God. Well, if you see a man that's keeping God's commandments, that's, that really cares about the Bible and is trying to live a righteous life and is, is making decisions in their life based off of what scripture says, that's a pretty good indication that they love God. Because Jesus said, you're going to keep my commandments. If you love me, you're going to keep my commandments. Psalm 1, we went over this on Wednesday. I just want to point this out again, though, because it's applicable here. The Bible says in verse number 1, Blessed is the man that walketh not in the counsel 
of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. Look at the guy's friends. Who does he hang her out with? Who is he spending all of his time with? If he's spending all of his time and is just best buddies with a whole bunch of worldly or wicked people, he's standing in the way of sinners, he's sitting in the seat of the scornful, he's walking in the council, because what do, what do friends do? They provide counsel. They provide advice, right? And all of his friends are wicked. All of his friends, none of them want to have anything to do with God. And this is who he's going to be getting his advice from? Pay attention to that. Because that guy's not going to be blessed. Now, it doesn't mean he's not saved. It doesn't mean, you know, he doesn't meet certain requirements. Maybe he goes to church, but pay attention to these things because they will impact his life. The, in, in Psalm 1, it says, blessed is the man. So if the blessed is the man who doesn't do these things, cursed is the man that does do these things. It's going gonna, it's gonna to go without saying that that's not someone that you want to be um, yoking up with. Verse number two, but his delight is in the law of the Lord. That is someone who's going to be blessed. When they delight in God's law, they, they love the Bible, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. These are things that are valuable. And when you're looking for a husband, you, if you could find somebody that's meditating in God's word, that cares about these things, you are finding a good thing. You are finding a good man. Maybe, you know, he may not be the, the, the most um, favored person in, as far as their appearance, but, but someone that loves God and is going to love you and is going to provide for you, that is going to be valuable to you. In, uh, turn, if you would, to 1 Corinthians chapter 14. I want you to see that. And I'm going to bring up Abraham as a good example of a really good man. Abraham is called the friend of God. Abraham was known to be a great leader, someone who ruled his household well. Abraham not only did a good job with his child, you know, with, with Isaac, but he also did a good job with his whole household. You remember when Lot was taken captive back um, before Sodom and Gomorrah were destroyed, there was a battle, and, and Lot and, and other people of Sodom were taken captive. Abraham was able to gather together his whole household and with a much, much smaller force was able to free all the captives that, that were taken captive from that, from that battle. And he was able to do that because he was a good leader. I mean, the people of his house were going to say, you're crazy. You know, you're going to go with our small group of people here against a much larger force? Like, you're nuts. But if he's a good leader, he's able to do it. And he was able to succeed and get victory. Obviously, God gets the victory for, for, for everything. But he had an influence over the people and the people knew that he was a man of his word and a man of integrity and they respected him for it. I'm going to read for you from Genesis 18 verse 19. This is the Lord talking about Abraham. He says, for I know him that he will command his children and his household after him and they shall keep the way of the Lord to do justice and judgment that the Lord may bring upon Abraham that which he hath spoken of him. God saying, I know Abraham. I know how he's going to raise his family. I know how he's going to raise his kids. I know how he's running his household, and it's very well. And you want to find a man like Abraham that's going to be also a very good leader in the home because the Bible says that the husband is the head of the household. Even as Christ is the head of the church, so is the husband the head of his wife. So ladies, when you're looking for a husband... God has already determined the authority structure, the way that he set it up. So if you're going to find somebody that is going to be above you in the authority of the home, you better find a wise man, someone who's going to make, who's going to know good judgment. That's what the Bible says, to do justice and judgment. Abraham had those attributes. Now, you're not always going to agree but if you find somebody that's wise, if you find someone that knows justice, if you know, find someone who knows judgment, you can at least rest and be a little bit more comforted knowing that, hey, I chose someone here that's wise in God's word. And we may disagree about this, you know, but, but ultimately he's the head and it's going to be easier for you to submit unto the authority of your husband when you know that your husband is a godly man, when you know that your husband's wise. It's going to make things easier on you. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, we're going to see another reference to this, to, to, to the husband being the spiritual leader in the house. So you want to find somebody that knows the word of God. 1 Corinthians 14, verse number 34. Verse number 34, the Bible says, Let your women keep silence in the churches. 
for it is not permitted unto them to speak. Now look, again, I didn't write this book, but I'm going to preach it because it's God's word and not mine, and I love it. And, and this has nothing to do with women being inferior or, or of less value because they're not. But there's rules, and guide, there's rules that God has established. And in the church, he says, let your women keep silence in the churches for it is not permitted unto them to speak. But they are commanded to be under obedience as also saith the law. Verse 35, and if they will learn anything, let them ask their husbands at home. For it is a shame for women to speak in the church. So what the Bible is instructing here is that if, if, a, if a woman wants to learn in church, she, uh, basically, you know, 1 Corinthians 14, you can see there's a lot there on how the church is to be run and it's supposed to be run decently and in order and everything's supposed to be done a certain way. And you can read that whole chapter. But basically it's saying it's okay for a man to pipe up and say something or ask something, you know, during the teaching time when the learning's going on. But he's saying, let the women keep silence. And, and, you know, if you have a question, you want to learn something, ask your husband at home. This is what the Bible is saying ought to be done. So if that's what ought to be done, you want to find a man that is going to be able to teach you, that's going to be able to help you out with your questions because they know the scripture and they know God's word. 1 Timothy chapter 5 is the last, uh, the last scripture we're going to turn to. 1 Timothy chapter 5. Ladies, you want to look for a man, and I'm trying to pack a lot into one sermon this morning. I could probably have separated it into, into one and the other, but first, or for, excuse me, first Timothy chapter five. Ladies, you want to find a man that's a hard worker. Someone that's not lazy. Someone, you, you know, we're covered. They, want, they need to know the Bible. They need to love God. They need to keep his commandments. These things are important, but find someone that's not lazy. Because again, if you're going to be filling your roles you need to find somebody that is going to fill his role of being the provider. First Timothy chapter 5, verse 8, the Bible says, But if any provide not for his, house, for his own, and especially for those of his own house, he hath denied the faith and is worse than an infidel. The Bible's saying, you know, when you're not providing for your own household, think about, think about how bad it is. I mean, just, just being an unbeliever. What's going to happen to unbelievers if they don't get saved, if they don't become believers, they're going to end up in a lake of fire. That's what an infidel is. And he's saying, if you aren't providing for your household, you're worse than that. You're worse than an infidel. That's pretty strong language. Again, and over and over throughout the Bible, you're going to find that God wants us to work hard, especially the men, to be hard workers, to provide, to love your wife as your own body. You can read Ephesians chapter 5, and, and you can see what, the, the way that, that a man is supposed to love his wife as Christ loved the church and gave his life for it. Someone who's dedicated to, to working their hands to the bone to provide for his family to provide for his wife, to provide for his children, and to go out and work and work hard. Ladies, if you're, if you're looking for a man and that man just kind of sleeps around all day and he's collecting unemployment and he's not, and look, it, just right there, if he's just collecting unemployment, find another man. <laughs> find another man. And I, I have no problem saying that because if they live in the United States of America and they're collecting unemployment, look, I don't care if you are willing to work, you can find a job and there's no reason for you in the United States of America to be collecting unemployment from the government ever. It just means you're not looking hard enough and you're not willing to work. People have this idea of, oh, well, I need a job that, that pays this much and oh, I'm, I can't take out the trash and I can't do these other jobs, so I'm just gonna collect unemployment until I find what I really want. No, get to work. It doesn't mean you can't find another job, but you need to be working as a man and working hard and not just accepting handouts. And ladies, that is a character issue. That is characteristic. You don't want to be, to be marrying someone who's supposed to be providing for you that can't even provide for himself. Seriously. Find someone who is a dedicated hard worker, someone who's dedicated to working hard for the Lord. Yes, amen, first and foremost, but also just a hard worker in general. Someone that, does, that can get up early and can stay up late and provide. Those are characteristics that you want to know. And then finally, a man that, that, that is a man of his word, someone that keeps his vows, because obviously it's going to be important in marriage. 
Someone that, that when they say something, they mean it and they do it. Someone that's not always just, oh man, oh, I know I said I would do this, but now I can't, you know, and just constantly just never able to, to keep their word. Again, it's a character issue. It's something that you, when, when you say something, you ought to, to mean it, and you need to find someone that's a man of their word. Someone you can trust because you know that they're faithful to their word. So there, there's a lot, I mean, there's, and, and this is a sampling, okay? This, I'm just trying to help people out on, on things to be looking for. When you're trying to find a spouse, these are good characteristics for men, for women, understanding the roles, understanding what's godly, what's not godly, and looking for that in another person. Now, nobody is perfect. I'm going to close on this point. There's, unfortunately, sometimes, especially in, in our circles, and people who love the Bible, love God, end up trying to find that unicorn, right? That perfect person, the, the, the one that just every single thing that you can possibly find to have the, the best attributes, like I'm, you know, if they don't have like, like all of these things checked off, then nope, 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 nope. You need to, to be able to have grace <laughs> because don't forget that they're looking at you too and I know that you're not perfect. And you have to remember that you're not perfect and that you do have problems. So we're looking for characteristics. We're looking for people, the way that they live their lives and, and the, the morals and the values that are guiding their judgment they're guiding their decision making and, and what they hold dear in their heart. But remember to have a little bit of grace <laughs> to allow for some flaws and some areas that need to be worked on, okay? Because everybody has that. So don't let one problem area or this or that you know, be, be a big issue for you. But some are major. I mean, some are deal breakers, and they ought to be. Some ought to just be deal. I mean, if you got someone who's a drunkard, uh, to me, that's just a deal breaker. I don't want to marry someone who's just addicted to the bottle. Not going to get involved in that. And when you're not married yet, you have that choice. So, and, and there's many others. That was just the first thing that came up in my head. But like, you know, Take the time to think about these things. Take the time to, to, to have these types of characteristics in your mind about what you're looking for so that you don't just end up getting wrapped up in just a ton of emotion with somebody and, and maybe not making a good choice in your life because all you did was base it on emotion and not really kind of looking at it. And I'm not saying, you know, emotion isn't necessarily bad. Emotion can be great. But make sure it's balanced with, with what the Bible is, is giving instruction on, on, on who we ought to be looking for. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for the great instruction that you give us from your word, Lord. Pray that you would please help us to, to study your words every single day because that, that, they'll help us out in every area of our life. I pray for the people who have not found a spouse yet that, they, that you would help them to find someone who's godly and... Um, that they would be able to, to use the proper principles that you've put forward in finding a spouse, dear Lord, and uh, help us not to be um, too hasty in our, in our judgments, but that um, we would find somebody and that, that could be a blessing and that we could bless them, dear Lord, and um, that ultimately you would end up blessing the marriage, Lord. I thank you for this, and I pray that you please help us to be examples to the world of no, it is possible even in 2018 to have successful marriages because we, we fear God and we're going to try to keep his commandments and that, we, and that we're going to be people of our words and we're not going to go back on our promises that we make before you. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.